Okay, so for this video, we're going to have a look at the Fulton Center by Grimshaw Architects, um, Arup and James Carpenter, and I guess more specifically, this uh, sky reflector net as it hangs in the atrium of that building, right? So this is a uh, cable net structure that forms a kind of a hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, there's a series of cables that run in these offsets between these perforated diamond-shaped metal panels. You can get a sense of that here in this image, um, where you can kind of get a good sense of the scale and... and, and um, and the detail, right, the connection detail that kind of holds it all together. And we're going to model all of this. We're going to model the structure, the form, um, uh, and the panelization. Focus on the panelization, really, um, uh, in this exercise. Okay, so surface description uh, part one, I guess, is uh, using this case study as our inspiration. Um, you can see that I've already got open the WS1 workshop one base file that uh, I've provided for you on the UV box. Uh, so please open that and you'll find inside a series of base surfaces, okay, that we'll use to get started. This will save us a bit of effort and really kind of let us focus in on just the grasshopper uh, work that we want to do here. So I'm going to just collect, or sorry, select this uh, surface uh, component here with the Fulton inside of it. I'm going to hit control C and I'm going to go ahead and file open sorry, file new document and copy and paste that into a new Grasshopper document, okay? I'm then going to right click on that and preview it so we can have a look, okay? So this is the, the overall form of it as I've modeled it in Rhino as, a, as a, just a simple Rhino surface. Uh, I'm also going to increase the resolution of my, of my Grasshopper previews um, by clicking on this little blue button over here at the top and turning on high quality. Uh, it's just a, a better representation of these kinds of forms. Um, and here's our surface. So here's our base. And you can kind of see that uh, it has a seam down the line here. And I want to talk a little bit about that because um, it'll be important to, uh, to notice these kinds of things in terms of potentially trying to address a, a problem that we may have when it comes to the process of panelizing this surface or subdividing it into those diamond-shaped pieces. Okay, and I'll show you that um, by using first the lunchbox component. Okay, so this is one of the add-ons that you've installed. Um, it has a very, very handy tool called the diamond panels uh, component, which again, you'll find the lunchbox tab up top if everything installed right. Over here you have a panels box and inside the first option is diamond. Okay. Um, it's asking for a surface input and we can go ahead and input our base. Now, the other thing is uh, to get into the habit always of turning off your, your previews of previous steps so that we don't have a confusing uh, preview here. We don't have a confusing geometry to look at. Uh, this is a kind of a coarse version, of course, right? So we need to increase the values of these U and V uh, divisions in either direction of that surface, okay? Uh, and now because I've gone through this uh, once or twice before using this exact base surface, um, I can kind of suggest a couple of values to use. And to do that, I'm just going to jump over, over uh, into the parameters tab, grab this yellow panel box here, and I'm going to type in 82 for one of those values. I'm going to make that smaller, and I'm going to copy and paste it and type in 12 into this one. Uh, take care not to hit enter um, after you type in the number, because this will lead to errors. Okay. So be sure that the cursor is just after the number. Uh, and then go ahead and plug in 82 into U and 12 into V. And what you'll see right away is a kind of a, let's say, a smoothening of our base geometry into something that resembles much more the, the Fulton sky reflector net. All right, so by d increasing this, we've basically increased the number of subdivisions and in so doing improved its resolution and created a representation of that structure uh, in a pretty, uh, I guess, in a pretty close approximation. Uh, now, one thing we have to pay attention to relative to the scene now is whether or not this kind of, the way of this way of working using this surface breakdown can handle and can kind of uh, ignore the seam and continue this kind of diamond shape pattern across it. Now, it doesn't look like it is, but we can test this in a really simple way. All right, so I'm going to turn off the preview of this diamond uh, this diamond panels component. And I'm going to stay in parameters and grab my surface parameter so that I can just preview only the diamond output here, okay, to get a sense for what's happening. 
ignoring the triangle output for now. Uh, anytime there's an edge, this component's going to draw a triangle because it fills the... Yeah, sorry, I had to pause there. But yeah, so what I was saying before is that um, there's a... Uh, anytime there's a seam, like you can imagine the top of the surface here, uh, it's going to complete the surface by drawing a triangle where it can't draw a diamond, right? Because it can't go any further. Uh, same thing is happening down where the seam is, right? And this is a, a tricky problem to deal with when it comes to surface subdivision. Um, so what I'm going to suggest in this case is that we, we don't use this method for this particular example, but we'll use it in the, in the, in the, the other examples for the uh, Smithsonian uh, roof canopy and also the uh, YAS hotel. So anyway, let's turn off this uh, preview and just kind of keep this, keep this there for a minute for comparison's sake. Um, but I am going to still break this surface down, right? I'm still going to s uh, subdivide this, except what I'm going to do later is turn it into a mesh so that I can use a handy tool in Kangaroo, which is to diagonalize it, uh, which is a simple way of, of uh, fixing this problem. So go to the Surface tab, go to Utilities, and you'll find the ISO trim is the fourth one down. Um, it says uh, subsurface here, which is a better name for it. Um, what we need to do is input a base surface. We know we have one, so go ahead. Uh, that will stay orange until we provide a domain. Okay, so this is going to basically describe how many times we're going to break it down in either direction. Um, now to do that, we can go to Math tab up top, and the domain box all the way to the left. You'll find all the way at the bottom of that uh, series of tools the divide domain squared. And I'm going to just plug in the default values of U and V into the domain input there and have a look at this. Uh, and we have a good start. Now, this is a different thing than, than what this was doing, right? It's a different uh, result. Uh, the diamond, of course, the diamond subdivision will create exactly that, diamond panels. This, though, is going to create basically rectilinear subsets of the, the base geometry. So they kind of squeeze and get tighter in the area. Uh, where, where you would expect that to happen and, and, and vice versa. Uh, but we have to increase the resolution in order to get a nice diagonalized mesh. And that's easily done here by uh, changing these U and V values similar to what we did here. Um, so go ahead and copy and paste those two panels from before. Um, but before plugging them in, change the values um, from 82 to 41 and from 12 to 6 and essentially cutting them both in half. And again, just from prior testing, uh, I've come to realize that this works for the next step in such a way that gives us a pretty good representation of the, of the net that we're trying to model. Uh, now we're going to shift away from surfaces, um, kind of move away from nerve surfaces that will inevitably give us this kind of seam. Right now the seam is being hidden because we have a series of kind of subsurfaces that are following along, right, parallel to that seam. So we can't really see it, but it is there. Uh, so let's convert these into meshes. And if we hover over the output, you'll see that we've got, uh, 200, in this case, 246 separate surfaces. That's a, a decent start. Uh, so go to the Mesh tab at the top. Over to the right, there's a Utilities box. And inside that box, you'll find Simple Mesh. And go ahead and, and convert, then, the, the output subsurfaces into simple mesh faces, right? And now what we've got is this kind of rectilinear mesh faces, changing the geometry from NURB surfaces to meshes. Again, making our lives a little bit easier coming into the next step. Uh, the last thing we have to do before we diagonalize it is to just kind of weld this together into a single mesh. And to do that, I'm going to use a really handy kangaroo tool. Uh, so go up to your kangaroo tool tab up to the top, find all the way to the right the mesh box, uh, the mesh uh, kind of tools box, and you'll see the combine and clean component, which looks like a little orange and blue brush or, or broom. Uh, so this isn't going to appear to be any different, but if we hover over this, we see that we've got a series of separate mesh faces. Here, instead, we've got one mesh uh, basically conjoining it all together for us, which makes the next tool function. And the next tool is in the same place. Okay, so Kangaroo 2 mesh box, and you'll see the diagonalized uh, just to the right, okay? So the diagonalized component is uh, going to do uh, what it sounds like it might, which is to uh, essentially draw a diagonal line across all of those boxes that we had before, um, uh, and, 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 and it's going to separate those mesh faces now into a, um, a series of diamonds as opposed to rectangles, okay? So we've now got a pretty nice mesh representation of 
the, the structure that we want to model, and we have one without seams. Okay, so this is a, a way to kind of rationalize, I guess, the base surface into something that we can now start working with, uh, just by going from surfaces to meshes. Okay. So the next steps now um, are going to be to simply offset these panels, kind of like what we had before with the Fulton, right? To kind of give it a gap in between. Uh, draw our cable net. This is essentially already our cable net, right? All we need to do is extract the line, so that's simple. And then what we're going to do is go through the simple process of identifying where we can put, first of all, where we can put our connection details, um, you know, again, which look like these little plus signs here, and then draw them. Uh, just as line segments for now. We're not going to get into the specifics of the actual profile of each of those connections. That um, uh, would take a little bit longer. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and, and start. Um, now, because we have a mesh and we want to extract lines to just draw the cable, um, there's a, a couple ways to do that. Um, one of them using Weaver Bird, and we'll just go over that one for now. Uh, so the Weaver Bird tab is, uh, is again, an add-on that the school has installed for us. Uh, you didn't have to install that, uh, but it has a, a series of very, very useful uh, mesh tools, one of them being to extract geometries from them, right? So if we go over to the Extract box in the Weaver Bird tab, you'll find um, the second one down is the Mesh Edges component, okay? And uh, what that's going to do is draw for you just the edges. It's going to ignore the faces and just draw the edges, and giving us a, a good representation of what that cable net structure is. Uh, kind of looks like in reality. Okay, so that's pretty much done. We could uh, put a little a bubble around that and save it. And to do that, I just right clicked on it. I'm sorry, I, I use the center kind of scroll button, clicked on it, and there's a kind of a little window, a uh, little menu that pops up, and I use this little green glob here to, f uh, to put a little, a little, I guess a highlight around that so that I can always go back to it uh, in case I have to bake that in for a drawing. Okay, the next step then is to uh, use the offset component, or uh, the scaling component, I should say, to, 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 to draw our offset panels, all right? And now the first thing we gotta do is then kind of, we have to uh, explode that surface, uh, sorry, that mesh again, right? Before we, we use this component to weld it, and that's because this required it, uh, but now we wanna explode it again because we wanna act on each one of those faces independently. So go to the mesh tab, and part of what you installed um, is these extra mesh components. And one of them is the mesh explode. So if you don't see this, there may be an installation issue and you should raise your hand and we'll come over and try to fix that for you. But if you do, grab the mesh explode, okay? And um, plug your mesh, right, the mesh output into the input of explode. And now you're gonna see this kind of appear again, um, but instead now we have a bunch of separate faces. That's a good thing. Uh, what we need to do then uh, is let's head over into transform, the transform tab, and go to the affine box over to the left, and one of them is scale, okay? Just grab the first one there with the two spheres, uh, scale. And uh, we can go ahead and plug in our mesh faces into the scale component, what you're going to see here is uh, something that's to be expected, right? Because by default, the center of scaling is the origin of the Rhino file, which is 0, 0, 0. And our factor is by default 0 0.5. So what we have is a kind of a, a half-sized version of everything above. Uh, we, we don't want to scale everything all together. We want to scale each of these independently. So that means we have to give the component uh, a different center point for each one of these panels. And that's um, relatively straightforward because we already have them separated. So go to the mesh tab up top. We can find a center point of that mesh of each one of the faces by using the mesh area component, right? And you can find that in analysis and the mesh area. And uh, by plugging that in, you'll see a, a grouping of points being drawn and they're at the centers of each one of these faces. It does also give you that numeric information about the area of each mesh face, but, uh, mesh face, but we don't need it. Um, so now I'm gonna plug in the center point, all right, from C to C. I'm going to turn off the preview for my mesh explode to kind of get a sense for where I stand here. And, and now I have a bunch of half-sized diamond panels that are now offset from one another, but probably too far, okay? 
Uh, so to fix that, I'm going to go to my parameters tab, grab a number slider, which is something you're probably familiar with by now. And this could be a slider that's between 0 and 1 because, again, it's a factor, right? It's a scalar factor. Uh, and the value of 1 will be a scaling of 0, basically, right? Because that basically means 100% of the size of the original geometry. Uh, value of 0 would, of course, throw an error because now we have nothing uh, to work with. It basically imploded the geometry. Anywhere in between uh, is basically a percentage of the size of, of, of what it used to be. We're going to use that as a way to kind of eyeball that offset. Now, if you want to be very specific about this, there's other ways to do this. Uh, but for the time being and just for this exercise, we'll just kind of use the eyeball method, um, uh, which in this kind of, let's say, schematic phase would be just fine to get some ideas out. And I'm going to kind of keep it at around 0 0.85 or something like that because it appears to be around the right offset you know, based on the photographs I've seen of the building. Okay, so we're, we're making a bit of progress here. We're actually quite close uh, in developing this uh, overall structure. Um, one thing you may have noticed about the structure, though, is that in the other image, you'll see that there's this, the, the way that the light is reflecting, it appears that there's a subtle bend down the center of these diamonds, uh, diamond-shaped panels. Uh, and that could be for a number of reasons, but, uh, but we can do that. Uh, we can, um, it's most likely because these panels are actually twisted a little bit in space, and in order to get them flat, it uh, could be a little bit easier and to keep these, I guess to keep also these um, connection details uh, intact uh, along the same plane. You can put a, a subtle bend in this. Now, we can, we can do that, and we can have that as one of our options uh, uh, by triangulating um, the, these, these mesh quads. And, and a mesh quad, regardless of a shape, is one that has four sides, right? Uh, a mesh triangle, of course, has three. So let's go over to the mesh tab once again. And in analysis, you'll also find mesh triangulate. Okay? And so let's go ahead and plug that in and just for the time being, turn off our, our scale preview. And you can see that a line, what looks like a line, has been drawn across all of those mesh faces. But in reality, it's broken down each one of those mesh faces into two, right? So it's taken the diamond and broken it, it's broken it down into two um, triangles, which are planar, right? 100% flat. Uh, if we were to bake this geometry into Rhino, which we'll do later, uh, and turn on the rendering, um, turn on the rendered view, you'll see that it will f reflect light in a very similar way that uh, the image does in reality. And uh, we can do that at the end. Uh, for now, let's leave this as it is. And in fact, just for the, again, for the sake of the exercise, I'm going to turn off the preview for that triangulate and just use this, just use this original, uh, the one we had before, basically, which is the scaled down version. Okay, so the next part and the last part is to just draw the connection detail. And uh, I guess this gets a little bit more tricky. Um, but uh, I'll just kind of walk you through a process that enables us to identify these four points, right? This, this one here, that one, that one, and that one, relative to the intersection point that, that, is sur that surrounds it, right? The, um, that, that all those points surround, I should say. Right, and we're going to do that for each. So that's a that's an that's basically an exercise in organizing the point data. Right, so we have a series of intersections that we can find, and then we want basically these four closest points, and we want to be able to sort them based on their distances away from that intersection, and that's the logic we're going to use to do this. Um, and there's longer again longer reasons for that that we can go over in class uh, if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's look at uh, first extracting those points from this series of lines, right, the kind of edges. Uh, and we're going to do, we're going to, again, because we're dealing with meshes, um, we're going to go to WeaverBird again, the WeaverBird tab at the top, WB, and instead of extracting lines, we're gonna now going to extract vertices, okay? So WeaverBird, the vertices component. I'll move this out of the way a little bit. Uh, and what I'm going to do is extract uh, I guess first, sorry, all four of the vertices uh, of each one of these diamond faces, that's basically all of its kind of extremities, right? So the four points that make up that diamond are now being drawn for us such that we could select them and actually use them as input. 
uh, into another, uh, into the next step, which is to uh, identify the relationship between these intersections and all these points. Okay. Uh, now, what I want to do now is, is something similar, but use a different component, because if I use this component on our original mesh, right, on our diagonalized mesh, I'm going to end up with the top points up here as well. And I want to ignore those for now because that's a different connection detail up top than I'm what I'm going to be drawing. I want to draw the plus sign, that kind of cross connection detail only here, and that's between four points, not between three. So I want to ignore these up top. Quick way to do that is to go to Kangaroo 2, go into our mesh tab once again, and you'll find the naked vertices component. Okay, so let's grab the naked vertices component and then input our diagonalized mesh, okay, uh, into it. Now, by default, this is going to give us more information than, than we actually want. So I, I usually like to turn off the preview for this component right away so I don't get confused. Go to my parameters tab, click a point parameter, and just show the closed points, right? The, the points that have... Um, in this case, what's called clothed, but what that really means is that they have neighbors on all sides. So basically, they have uh, um, this is a point that's clothed because it has mesh faces on all sides of it, whereas this would be, technically speaking, a naked edge uh, because it doesn't have any, it knows that it doesn't have any mesh faces uh, to the above, right, to the, uh, to the area above. Uh, kind of clever. So why do we do all this? Well, we're going to use these. Now, right now, there's no relationship, okay, between these vertices and those, right? There's really no relationship. They're in different orders, right? They're organized differently in, in Rhino. Uh, we're going to change that by uh, selecting a, a series of nearest four, all right? And we can do that by going up to the Vector tab, going into our Point Tools, and selecting the closest point component. Um, sorry, the closest points, plural component because we want to select more than one. All right, so let's grab that. Uh, this is going to look for a couple of specific inputs. Okay, so one of them is the point to search from, and the other is the cloud of points that you're searching, right? So the points that we want to search from are these intersections because these are, um, these are going to, we're going to use these as a way to organize the other four. So we can plug that uh, point parameter into the P input and the cloud that we're searching is this overall set, right, of points. Um, now, what's happening here is it's going to go a little bit slow, and um, this is a problem actually. If I look, if I look at my output, um, I'm actually so uh, I I've, I actually have what 721,000 points, and that's because I wasn't careful. I didn't match my data. Um, what we want to do, we don't want to search this cloud as a kind of set of distinct kind of packaged points. We want to search it as an overall single cloud. So we have to flatten that output. Okay. Hopefully that didn't crash any of your computers, by the way. And if so, I apologize. Um, but really what we want to do is flatten this output so that this is just one big cloud of points. You can see here uh, that this thing can kind of work on and work its magic. Now, it's also going to search um, for the closest number of points based on the n input, so how many you want uh, to organize, how many you want to find. Uh, we want four, right? So this point is near a series. I wanted to select the four nearest to it, right? And that's going to be these four around it. So I'm going to put in a panel, give it a value of four, plug that into n. And now if I look at my output, I've got um, in this case, 1,804 points that are organized really nicely into sets of four. Now, you might not be surprised to know that the, um, the n I guess if you were to, to uh, multiply uh, 451 points uh, by four, you end up with your overall value here, right? So 451 times four is 1,804, okay? Uh, and that's because each one of those points now has four that are associated with it. That's very good because we can use this to our advantage um, to then draw individual connection details okay, between these panels. So let's work on that. Now, as I said before, uh, these points are organized into groupings of four. Uh, now, in order to figure out how to draw the line between, let's say, that point and that one, and that one and that one, 
we need to uh, figure out which is which. So how are they ordered? Uh, go to your sets tab at the top and over to the left you'll see the list of components. Uh, the first one there um, to the bottom left or even if you click on it you'll see it to over to the right here is the list item. Okay, it's a very handy component used all the time. And let's, uh, let's input this into here for now. And what it's doing is only showing us, if I click on it, you can see on my screen here that things have gone green. Uh, it's only showing us the uh, one of those points out of the four, and that's the one that's zero indexed. Now, it's likely that they're all in the same location, so if I kind of zoom around, I can kind of get a sense that, yes, they're all, well, most of them, right? So you can see that, let me zoom in a little bit here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, let's zoom in right in this area here. On this diamond, it's the leftmost point. On that diamond, it's the leftmost point. Uh, this diamond here, um, it's uh, hard to see because there's not a preview, but here, it's the rightmost point. So you can see that it's not actually organized uh, all the same uh, for each one of these diamond panels, and that's a little bit of a problem if we want to draw a straight line uh, all at once. Um, because if I plug in an, uh, a line input, I might go from there to there by accident. So what I need to do then is resort these points once again based on the distance that they are apart from their intersection. Um, so I'm going to introduce the sort uh, tool, which is, uh, again, quite good. So I'm going to delete that, um, that, list, um, that list item uh, component for now in order to do some sorting. So I'm going to go back over to sets, go to my list box here and grab the sort list component okay uh, now I'm going to um, input the P into my a input here okay so this is the points themselves so this is the one that accepts geometry and these are the things that we're going to sort relative to the data the data is what's being output here so these are the actual distances from the intersection points that each one of these four are so we're going to use that, and that data is going to is is easily organized into uh, high values and low values. Uh, so we're going to sort first the numerical data, and in so doing, sort the points relative to that. And I'm going to turn off some previews to keep things clear. So now we have some new newly sorted points. Now, if we go back into our sets tab, grab that list item component once again. And input uh, the A, sorry, the, the A out, uh, output here goes into the L uh, input of that. Uh, these will now be organized all the same, uh, or at least similar enough to get my uh, to get my points drawn right, to get my connections drawn right. And what I did here is I zoomed in on the the list item component because, as you can see, as I zoom in, uh, these little plus minus symbols appear, and I'm going to use that as a way to uh, in one component draw and be able to select each one of those four points independent from one another, right? Just by kind of adding the outputs. And we only need up to three here because we already have the first one use, using the I, uh, the I output, okay? Turn off that preview. Uh, now I'm just gonna play a little connect the dots, all right? So I'm gonna go to the curve tab, use my line component there, the first one under primitives, and I'm just going to start connecting the dots. And you can see that just the, um, the two shortest ones, right, the two distances that are the shortest from this center is going to be these two points. So that's the first two in order, and I can simply draw a line between them. And that's the first part of my connection detail. Uh, copy and paste that component, and then draw the other line. And now, as you can see, we have drawn uh, the, the beginnings of that connection everywhere. Right, using just the simple logic of organizing the points uh, and organizing all of our data uh, as, a, as one big uh, set of independently grouped data points. Okay? Uh, and because we've sorted them all in the using the same rule, they're all ordered uh, independently but ordered in the same way, which allows our lines to be drawn properly. This is something that's a bit hard to explain, but, one, but something that is uh, quite important when it comes down later on down the line when you're um, doing something like this and uh, you're finding that your data sets are just a little bit out of order. Uh, sometimes you have to kind of put them back in place. 
The last thing I want to do is you can see what's happening. I'm just kind of connecting to the points. Uh, and uh, to make this a little more accurate, what I want to do is extend these lines now a little bit into the panel um, to a dimension that I'm, again, going to eyeball for the purposes of this exercise. And that's a simple thing. Um, I'm just going to use the extend command for this. So while I'm already in curve in the curve tab up top, I'm going to just go over to my, uh, I believe it's in utilities here. Uh, yeah, you'll find it right at the top, uh, extend curve. I'm going to drop that in, uh, and I'm going to input my first line, my series of line segments into that. Um, by default, the type of extension is already set to line, so that's fine. And we have to put a value, regardless of uh, whether or not it's zero, into both the, the kind of extension at the start and the extension at the end. Uh, luckily for us, what we want to do is actually extend both directions. Um, so what I'm going to do is grab a slider, parameters, slider, right? And uh, just go ahead and plug that value into both uh, zero and one. And you can see that I've extended this quite a distance. Uh, and I'm going to play with that that uh, slider just a little bit in order to, again, kind of eyeball where the endpoint of that connector might actually attach itself to the panel. Okay, and I'm going to kind of inset it in a little bit. And to make that a little bit more clear, I'm going to go over to my curve tab once again and grab my endpoints, which is over in analysis. Okay, just grab the end points here just to draw them because the preview of that little X is actually pretty helpful to get a sense for where that thing might connect to the... Um, to the, to the diamond panel. And once you've got this, you can just go ahead and copy and paste those three components and just input the other line. Uh, and then uh, change, probably increase that slider value for this one a little bit because um, we're going into the more acute angle here and we're probably gonna wanna extend it a little bit further so that our proportion of, you know, the kind of distance of this connection relative to its edges here is about the same, um, you know, as a kind of a rough uh, approximation, uh, as a rough estimate. Now if we zoom out a bit, we can see that we've drawn all of those connectors in the exact same way relative uh, to their locations, okay? Um, and, uh, and that would be a, a good way to start. Again, uh, further uh, down the line, if you need to specify an exact distance from these edges or this point to the connector, um, that could be done, of course, with a dimensional constraint. For now, we're just using an extension. Uh, and again, that's the logic that I decided to employ here for this particular example, um, treating it a little bit more like a kind of schematic um, sketch, if you will, of the Fulton Skynet. Okay, that wraps us up a little bit here. Um, uh, uh, if you're interested, again, in going back and, and ch checking out this triangulation, feel free uh, just to really quickly do that uh, with you would be to simply right click on the triangulated, uh, sorry, that, that triangulated component, bake it into a uh, default layer uh, or layer five, which is white. Uh, either one will lo look fine. Um, I'm going to uh, drop out of Grasshopper for a second and just go to Rhino. Um, and I'm gonna take that baked geometry and move it away for a second. Um, and I'm going to turn on my, first of all, my shaded preview to have a look, see how it's going. And I can see that I've drawn all those, uh, those mesh faces independently. Um, but we can't really get a sense of, you know, that triangulation just yet until we turn on flat shade. So type in flat shade in the command line and you'll see that we get a good start at that here. Now you can start to see how that uh, again, it's starting to resemble a little bit more of what the Fulton uh, looks like in reality. Uh, but to get a better view of that even, you can turn on the rendered um, option, um, the rendered viewport option and get a, get a good view of it. Uh, it would even be even better if you changed your background to white or something, but you get the idea just by kind of scrolling around a little bit. And I'll go back into this view for a second because I think that looks kind of like what we want. Um, again, back to this, pretty similar. Uh, so I think we've got a pretty good uh, representation of the Fulton film. Okay, any questions, let us know. See you in the next one. Thanks.